Good morning, everybody. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Glad you're here. I hope when you came in, you were all able to grab one of these little things at the, at the table. It's, we're going to be doing a communion afterwards, and we're not wanting to serve it and hand, everybody handle it. So did anybody not get one that's planning on taking communion? No? Okay. I think Helen's serving herself. Good. <laughs> yeah, just a reminder that we're still in a situation where we have to wear our masks. I know the the... Unless, unless you have health reasons not to. Um, I know things are getting so much better, but they're a little slower in catching up with the rules. So, um, um, yeah, so I encourage you, if you're able to, please keep your masks on during the service. And uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to come together and to worship you, and to hear from you, and to experience you. Thank you, Lord, that where two or three are gathered together in your name, that you are there in the midst. And we just pray, Father, that you would meet each one of us where we are. Each one of us walked through these doors with different things weighing on our hearts, different things weighing on our minds. Uh, for those of us who've had a really awesome week, uh, we come here to give you thanks and give you praise for all the good things you've done for us. For those of us who've come here and it's just been terrible and we've had a really rough time of things, I pray, Lord, that you would bring comfort, that you would bring peace, that you would, um, by your spirit, begin to, to work in our hearts and let us know that you've got all things under control. And for those of us where it's just been one of those weeks where it's been very routine and ordinary, we again give you thanks and praise that you are the God of the ordinary. You're the God of, of our daily routines. And so we thank you for who you are. And I just pray, Lord, that for wherever we are and wherever we've come from, that you would meet us here and that when we leave this place, we'll leave this place in somehow different, somehow we'd be different from the way we walked in. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's read together the words of scripture that will be on the screen. The word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. We have all received grace after grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That passage is taken from one of the most beloved, one of the most beautifully written passages in the entire Bible, in my humble opinion. Uh, the first chapter of the book of John. And it contains some really huge ideas, the ideas of grace and truth and law. And when, when you're reading something that was written by a, a scriptural author, generally speaking, the thing that they say first is the thing that they want to emphasize. It's the most important thing. And I think it's wonderful that, that the writer says grace and truth. He doesn't say truth and grace. Jesus didn't come to say, you guys are such a mess and you need to figure out what a mess you are. And then if you ask me nicely, then I will forgive you. Jesus came to say, I am already holding out to you everything that you need. Before you can even know that you need to ask for it, I'm already holding out for you. You just need to understand that you have to reach out and take it. One of the, the amazing things that happens when we, we look at uh, Jesus' crucifixion like we will be remembering this morning in communion is just looking at the simple bare physical facts of what happened on that hill in that morning. What a bunch of human beings did to another human being. We can look at that and we can see truth. We can see this is what we are capable of. This is what the broken human spirit and heart is capable of doing to another human being. But it's important to know that before we get as far as recognizing that truth, Jesus is already on the cross. Jesus is already giving us grace. Jesus is already providing us with a way to be forgiven. Truth is about us being broken. Law teaches us that we can't fix ourselves. And grace, which existed before we knew we needed it. Grace sets us free. <clears throat> Thank you. 
There's so many of us, for all of us. That story, that journey, that takes us through dangers and toils and snares and ends up in eternity, sharing eternity with the God who loves us and who knows us better than anyone. It starts. scripture passage we're going to look at today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 2. We would normally have Bibles in the pews, but their health unit doesn't want us handling a bunch of things, you know. So if you've got it on your phone, you can check that out. Or just listen, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 10. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. 
And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should boast, or should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these great surpassing revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, my, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, for, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Lord, thank you for your word that teaches us and guides us and makes us more and more into the image of Christ as we apply it to our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would take these powerful words of yours and these weak words of mine and that you would be power and weakness and that you would give us ears to hear what it is you want to say to us this morning. Father, please give me the strength to do this and take this time, Lord, as yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So I had to do a bit of review of my high school grammar in order to prepare for this morning, trying to figure out what's the difference between an oxymoron and a paradox. They're similar in that they involve two seemingly contradictory ideas, but, the, but their presentation is kind of different. An oxymoron is two words side by side that are in essence contra contradictory, but are used to try to explain something. Examples like jumbo shrimp, working vacation, instant classic, virtual reality, government intelligence. Oh, sorry, that one slipped in, I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean that. A paradox is more of a complete sentence that presents two ideas that on the surface seem contradictory, but when you really consider what's being said, you realize that, yeah, it actually does make some sense. And Christianity can be hard for some people to accept because there are some apparent paradoxes in some of the basic ideas of the Christian faith. And in our Western way of thinking, these paradoxes are, are hard to wrap our minds around, hard to grasp and accept. And this morning we want to look at one of the key paradoxes of the Christian faith and how understanding it and accepting it can have a life-changing impact. Strength is something that is respected in our North American culture, and at times it's even feared. Strength is something that we're, we're all expected to aspire to, whether it's physical strength and health or emotional, mental, social strength. We raise our kids, teaching them to be self-sufficient, to be able to get out and earn a living, to be able to to handle whatever comes in their life, to stand on their own two feet. It's a badge of merit to be able to say that we are able to stand on our own two feet in life. By contrast, weakness is not something that's usually praised. Physical weakness is treated so that that physical weakness will be diminished and, and strength will be restored. Those who live with ongoing physical weaknesses are cared for, um, yet as anyone with disabilities will tell you, I'm missing a page. Where did it go? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, there, pe people with physical disabilities aren't always fully able to integrate into society. I mean, a lot has changed in the last 50 years, and it's a lot better than it used to be, but society today still revolves around the strong. When it comes to emotional or mental weakness, we are encouraged today to be more transparent than in days gone by, yet there's still a measure of stigma. Exposing weakness is not generally considered to be as beneficial as demonstrating strength. In working with youth and young adults over the years, a word I would often hear that comes into play when we're talking about building strength in people is the word resiliency. I've heard of seminars that parents can go to, how to build resiliency in your children. 
In a lot of my studies that I did on the effects of divorce on teens and children, people will often say, oh, oh the kids are resilient. Um, they'll, they'll get over it. They'll, they'll, they'll manage. They'll bounce back and become themselves again. And when I've heard that over the years, it just annoys me to no end. Because the truth is that the kids aren't resilient. Well, because they're not supposed to be resilient because they're kids. We're the adults. We're supposed to be resilient on their behalf. Being a role model of resiliency until they reach that age where a certain level of resiliency can be reasonably expected of someone. Strength is more positively viewed in our society than weakness. When we first meet someone, especially like if it's a potential dating situation, um, what do we tell the other person about ourselves? Do we tell them our weaknesses? Do we tell them all the things we're not good at? Is the first thing I tell someone about myself, oh, I can't repair a car to save my life, can't even change my own oil, and put a paintbrush in my hand, and I will get more paint on the floor and on myself than on the wall. Both of which are true, by the way. But, you know, we try to put our, we wouldn't say that, we try to put our best foot forward. We accentuate our strengths. And sometimes we might even cross the line into boasting. And Paul, in our passage this morning, begins by boasting. But, but he feels horrible about it. The Corinthian church has been invaded by false teachers who are gaining a following about themselves, uh, for themselves by boasting about their credentials, boasting about the things that they, who they are, their credentials to teach, their credentials to lead. They're boasting to impress the members of the church so that they'll end up gaining a following, so that people will listen to them. And yet what they're teaching the church members is not a true gospel. It's a false gospel, a faulty theology, a, a, a wrong idea of who God and Jesus is. So Paul's desire, since he f helped found this Corinthian church, is to help them get back on track with what they need to believe, with what the orthodox basic beliefs are regarding following Jesus. And so he goes, okay, 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 if credentials are what really impress you, if boasting catches your ear, well, well, I know a guy. And he begins to tell them about a man who had received direct visions and revelations from the Lord 14 years earlier. Things that go beyond words, things that, that this man isn't even permitted to talk about. It's just so incredible and amazing. And as he continues to talk about who this man is and his experiences, the grammar slowly shifts into the first person. And the Corinthians realize, as they read this letter, that the person Paul is talking about is himself. He has every right to be boastful of his relationship with God based on what he has experienced, based on what has been revealed to him. There's another letter that Paul wrote to another church, and, and he's in a similar situation of being forced to boast against his will, against his better judgment, but, but he needs to get the disciples to see um, that they're heading down these fault paths of false teaching. And so Paul talks about how he was educated by the, the best religious leaders, that he was a Pharisee of all Pharisees, that how he was extremely knowledgeable and faithfully devoted to all the Jewish religious laws. But in the end, these areas of strength are not what really matters. As humans, our default position can be to, to build ourselves up, even puff ourselves up a bit when, when talking about ourselves, maybe even cross that line into bragging or boasting a bit, especially if we feel we're not getting the proper recognition we feel like we deserve from those around us in our daily lives. We can have a tendency to even be a little conceited sometimes and think a little highly of ourselves. And Paul in verse 7 admitted that, that he could be like that too. Not only did he realize that he could be like that, but he knew that God knew that he could be like that. And so God gives to Paul what Paul describes as a thorn in the flesh. Something that would serve as a reminder of his weaknesses when he, when he was tempted to start believing his own press when he was tempted to start getting too big for his britches, when he was tempted to, to boast of his strengths and only rely on, the, on them. The church where I grew up in Montreal, there were some people who would always debate and try to figure out what is Paul's thorn in the flesh? Because he, Paul doesn't tell you. He just says he has a thorn in the flesh. 
And I think they wanted to somehow prove that it wasn't some sort of physical ailment because, because they had this theology of health and healing that you know, a, a strong believer should never be sick. And they couldn't wrap their head around Paul being physically sick, so a thorn in the flesh couldn't be that. But Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in writing this, was very, very wise. He did not tell us what his thorn in the flesh was because if he had told us, say it was poverty was his thorn in the flesh, then all the rich and even middle class people wouldn't be able to write, relate to what he's saying. But by not knowing exactly what it is, we can all relate because we all have our thorn in the flesh. We all have that one thing, that one weakness that reminds us that we're not all that in a bag of chips, as my sister would say. That reminds us that even in the midst of some pretty neat strengths that we might have, we're still human and we still have our weaknesses. It can be something physical, which gets in the way of the things that we really like to do and really like to be. It can be an ongoing temptation towards certain sins that, that don't seem to torment other people, but they sure harass us daily. It can be an emotional or a mental thorn that makes it difficult to cope with what comes along in life. All of these things and more can be thorns in our lives that, if they really take hold, can all but paralyze us, can seriously get in the way of living the life that God has created for us to live. No doubt Paul felt the same way about his thorn because verse 8 tells us that three times he pleaded with God, please take this away from me. Three times he came before God and begged him to take that thing away that constantly reminded him that he wasn't as strong as he thought, that he wasn't as strong as he could boast about. Three times. My first reaction reading that was, that's it? Three times? I mean, if we're honest, we've probably asked God hundreds of times, Lord, take that away, just that just thing that just torments me, take it away. But whether it's three or 3,000 times that we ask God to take it away, his answer to us is the same as his answer to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. His grace is enough. His grace is amazing. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ. His grace is sufficient. Grace is God's favor towards us. It's the reality that God loves you and that he is constantly reaching out to you and that he really, really, really wants to bless your life daily. Some of us have developed a picture of God over the years as someone whose love we have to earn. That we have to do things in order to please him and chalk up brownie points with God so that he'll love us. And then if we don't, that he'll withhold his love from us. Some of us might even be convinced that God hates us, either because of a horrible shame of what we've done or, or because of things we've been told. It's been about 16 years that I've done youth groups and youth drop-in meetings in the church basement here. I've only had it happen once, but it struck me where a teen refused to come into the building. I said, why? Well, he said, well, if I come in, the roof will cave in on me. He was convinced that God hated him so much. Fortunately, it was only once, but sometimes there are people who feel that way. There are people who have a really hard time believing that God is someone who really loves them and whose deepest desire is to bless their lives. But we have a hard time accepting that because we, I think we kind of know deep down we don't deserve it. We haven't earned that kind of favor, but that's the definition of grace. That's what grace is all about. God's unmerited love and favor towards us. I've shared this before, so if you've heard it, just I'm going to share it again. Uh, the difference between mercy and grace. Say, um, say you steal 20 bucks from me and you get caught. Mercy says, well, I'm sure you've learned your lesson and you're not going to do it again. I've got, I've got my 20 bucks back. Let's just call it even. I won't press charges. I'll give you a, you have a second chance. That's mercy. Grace says, 
You must really need the money. You know, just, just keep the 20 bucks. In fact, here, here's another 20 bucks. It's yours. And of course, I'll drop the charges. And if there's anything else I can do to help you, let me know. I'm here for you. There have been times when I've shared that and I've noticed people shake their heads or even smirk or snicker because it's just not, it's not realistic. It's just not realistic. And the truth is, it isn't. But that's what makes God's grace so incredible, so amazing. Because it goes so far beyond what any human could do. And it's a grace that he pours out on you, pours out on me, if we'll receive it. But here's the thing. Grace, that giving of a second chance, that pouring out of help and resources and strength in a time when we need it most, won't be perceived by us to be something that, we're, that we need if we're boasting of our strengths. If we're just going to rely on our own strengths, we'll feel, well, I don't need that grace. We'll pass it up. We'll pass up the strength that God wants to pour into our lives if we don't feel that we have any need of His strength because I've got it all under control. We, won't, we need to be able to acknowledge that, yeah, yeah, I need that. There are weaknesses in my life. So Paul says, you know what? I have every reason to boast of my strengths. But I know that's only going to get me so far. In the eternal scheme of things, it's not going to actually get me anywhere. So instead of boasting in my strengths, I will boast in my weaknesses. Because when I am weak, it is then that I'm strong. And therein lies the paradox. You've got a measure of resiliency. You've got a measure of self-sufficiency. But when it comes to the thorns in your life, your strength isn't enough. But God's grace is. And when we realize that our weaknesses, uh, when we real, sorry, when we realize our weaknesses and, and acknowledge them, when, when we reach out and accept the grace that God is offering us, it's then that we become strong, not in our own strength, but in His. When I am weak, then I am strong. When I am overcome by weakness, when sickness and disease attack my life so that I'm not the one I was, when something's going on in my body and I just can't do the things I used to do, His grace is enough. His power is made perfect in my weakness. When I am weak, I will be strong in him. And when I am attacked by insults, not simply, you know, the joking put-downs that we all give to each other, but when I'm attacked by words that do damage, when I'm kicked when I'm already down, when people let me know in no certain, uncertain terms that they think they're better than me and lay it on me thick and my self-worth just hits rock bottom, his grace is enough. His power is made perfect in my weakness. And when I am weak, I will be strong in Him. When I face hardships, when the rigors of daily life become too much, when everyone wants a piece of me and I, I can't meet all their needs, when tragedy strikes, when calamity and distress take over, so that my daily routine just goes out the, out the window and survival is the best I could possibly hope for, his strength is enough. His grace is enough. His power is made perfect in my weakness. For when I am weak, then I will be strong in Him. When I encounter persecution, when people mock and attack me for what I believe, when someone just seems to have a hate on for me because I follow Jesus, when the time comes down the road when I face situations like believers in other countries face where they lose jobs, lose finances and status, even lose their freedom because of what they believe, well, His grace is enough. His power is made perfect in my weakness. And when I am weak, I will be strong in Him. When life is filled with difficulties, when I feel like I'm between a rock and a hard place, when I feel like I'm backed into a corner with no way of escape, when I have to deal with situations that I have absolutely no control over, no capacity to change, His grace is enough. 
His power is made perfect in my weakness, for when I am weak, I will be strong in him. Paul says that he will boast all the more gladly about his weaknesses, so that the power of Christ's mercy, power of Christ's grace and forgiveness may rest in him. I will boast and acknowledge all the more that I am a sinner, so that the power of Christ's mercy, grace, and forgiveness may rest on me. I will boast and acknowledge all the more that there are times that I just can't cope, so that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, can then guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus, so that he will be able to do in my life exceeding abundantly more than, he can ask or even, than I can ask or even think. I will boast and acknowledge all the more in my physical limitations and weaknesses so that his power and strength may rest in me, enabling me to do, maybe not what I could do before, and maybe not what I would want to do now, but to be able to do what he wants me to do now in the present. Embracing the Christian life, embracing a life of following Jesus means embracing the paradox, to acknowledge that I am weak, but that's a good thing, because my weaknesses are opportunities for the power of Christ to live in me and through me, because when I am weak, then am I strong. Would you pray with me, please? With our head bowed and eyes closed, just so that we're not distracted and we can focus. Maybe you're here today, and it's a, the paradox we've talked about is something that is hard to understand. Maybe you're here today, and it's like, yeah, I've been, I'm strong. I've been relying on my own strength, but there are times in life when you realize it's not enough. And maybe today is a day when you can say, okay, yeah, I'm weak. But God, your grace is enough. Maybe today is a day when you could accept that grace and accept that forgiveness and, and welcome God's strength into your life. Maybe you're here today and yeah, you've acknowledged the paradox and you've embraced it, but it's, lately it's just been too much. You've seen God's strength and power in your life before, but it's just not, it doesn't seem to be as readily available right now because it's just too much. Maybe today you just need to sit before God and tell him that and ask him for strength. Ask him for grace. Ask him to help you be able to see the grace and strength that maybe that's right there, but it's just beyond your grasp. Whatever it is you need to tell God right now, whatever it is you need to hear from God right now, take a moment in this silence. Make this message personal in your life. will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know from all my, with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Thank you, Lord, that you paid, you paid it all on the cross. 
that through your death and resurrection and through the giving of your Holy Spirit to, to us in this life now, we have access to your strength. We have access to your grace and to your mercy. And I just pray, Lord God, for each person in this room, when the time comes, when, when things are just too much, I pray that you would help us all to turn to you, to throw ourselves at your feet and just say, your grace is enough. Lord, I know it's not always pleasant to, to admit weaknesses, but I pray that you'd give us the humility and strength to be able to do that. And to be able to know that in that weakness, you can be strong in us. Help us, Lord, to be able to, to give up the things that we hold on to so that we could hold on to your strength and your power. Lord, thank you for your amazing grace that is enough for us. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.